honest. The whole future thing has always been there, worrying about it, wondering, seeing more than I should. It's just, recently, I've been getting lost in the past more. I can't help thinking about Bronze Age women. It's no wonder I have no friends. What was it about this girl? Who was she? Was she strong? I bet she had blonde hair too. I bet that no one ever told her what to do or expected her to know what to do. Would it help you to know? Yes, but don't ask me to explain why to you, because I don't know why. That's okay. Let's see if we can find out. See. Well, if you want to see the past, I am a storyteller. I can show you a weave of truth and magic. I've got nothing to lose. In that case, let us away, for the Bronze Age awaits. I poured the smelted tin into this cold water. The steam has stopped. Now I can take it out. Marwin, don't touch it! Ginny, you know the water is how we see. Now the tin will help us see a world beyond. Look closely now. Come on, sister. Get your stuff together now. As your brother, I am telling you what is best for you. No, I'm just telling you what to do. Make the preparations. I'm not running away, Trin. I've made the preparations I need to here. I just want to know you're safe. I should never have told you something was coming. Well, you did. And now I'm telling you not to face it. Stop fighting for a moment. I can't. You can. You are the one who can see these things, Marwin. Tomorrow is an important day for you. In your honour, let's think about that. I don't care about my day. Anyone could have killed that bear. Possibly. But you did. Is that it? I face a ceremony tomorrow, and you expect me not to think about what you may face? A monument will be built to celebrate your strength in protecting our farm. No! Dead, Jimmy? No! Trin, Trin, no. calm. Calm yourself. Calm? How can this be? It was the will of the gods, Trin! How do you even dare to speak to me? The gods decide our fate. This fate was decided by you. You took things into your own hands. Trin, that is a terrible accusation to make. Then I'll you make it. Seriously. Boy, you dare to speak to me like that? Ginny, stay out of this. That is, that is the end of only one part of our story tonight. Further along the way, up by the gate, we have an appointment in 440 AD. Someone extraordinary is about to emerge. Good riddance to the Romans. Why do you say that? My grandfather was a Roman soldier. Our oppressors. They guarded our coast against the Saxon pirate. They built straight roads. Oh, yes. And they enslaved the population under an emperor who we never even saw, who spent all of his time and our taxes fighting wars on the other side of the world. They made us a part of civilization. Part of militarization, you mean? They gave us peace. And now we have the Saxons threatening to burn our homesteads and destroy the British way of life. Well, maybe if we hadn't grown soft under the Romans, we'd be in a better position to defend ourselves when they went back to Rome and left us in the lurch. If you want a talisman, an amulet, 
Look at my tin bean. Someone's coming. Who is it? Artorius, hard to believe. Is it him? I can't see. He's not on his horse. They say he wants to strike a deal with the miners. Where the Wallabrook rises. That's the one. They say he wants to find the tin for the armourers to make greaves. He's on foot. Ooh. Daughter of Imogen. Young woman with a face as pale as meadow sweet. Where did you obtain that tin bead you wear round your neck? We need all the tin we can get to make armour to defend our men's bodies against the battle axes of the Saxons. I was given this barrel shaped bead by my mother, Imogen, daughter of Agnes. It's been passed down my family through the generations. It has magical power. Its sacred nature as jewelry will be far more useful at keeping us safe from the Saxons than if it were to be diluted into a piece of armor. It's tin, nevertheless. D don't take her beads. Um, take this Roman coin instead. A Roman coin? Silver? But keep it, young man, and let the girl keep her tin be too. I like her spirit and your generosity. I believe I am going to need magic to protect our people. Why do you say that? A mighty warrior like you. These are dark times. <laughs> too dark! for us to shed light on without help from power beyond our understanding. I am gathering a band of warriors to fight. But in the end, it is knowledge of mind, rather than force of hand, that will win out. And so on he goes, along his way. Wish him luck, he'll need it. Does he know yet that he'll become the greatest king of British myth and legend? Perhaps he does. We're gonna move forward 500, 600 years to 1000 AD, to the time of the Saxons. Onwards, this way, down the road. Stand this. You have to stop complaining. How can I? And how can you just stand there, Bron, and act like nothing has happened? I'm not. You are. Are you forgetting what we fought for? The war is over, Gallen. We need to move on. I know, but this is madness. They want us to be at peace. Why can't you just try and be nice? There are no Vikings here. I... Would you like some mead? Yes, please. Of course. Are you enjoying the party? <laughs> yeah, sure. It's better than being up on the hillsides with the cows. That is important work you're doing. Mm. But of course, it's better being down here with us. <laughs> wow, I'm going to leave you to your mead. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. What? I was just trying to be nice, like you said. They are never going to talk to us now. Who was that you were giving me to? Oh no. What do you mean, oh no? I mean, I think you've already spied another boy to keep your eye on. And why is that so bad? Well, because you're going to try and find out who they are. Yes. And then try make a plan to go and speak to them. Yes. And then make me come with you. Because you're my friend. <sighs> And then you'll fall and we have to clean up the mess. But you don't know that'll happen this time. Don't spoil my fun. At least he's a Saxon this time. Was this fair Saxon? Nothing. We were just talking about my cows. <sighs> One of them's produced a lot of milk this week, but the butter's taking ages. You weren't talking about the butter. 
You talk about one of those Saxon boys. You stay away from him, Wolfwen. What, good looking is he? At least it's not a Viking this time, Leafa. Oh, for goodness sake. Well, let's be honest now. You're after at least two Vikings, being a good girl, doing what you're supposed to, integrating with them, and then they leave you high and dry. They did not leave me high and dry. And I'll have you know, one of them took a lot of interest in me and left me the luck of the land. Well, if that's all he left you, we should go and talk to those Saxon boys. Much better looking, and will leave with more than luck. Oh, here you go again. Well, come with us. No, you go. I'll stay turning. Good on them for going for it, I suppose. I'll just talk to my cows again tomorrow. So tell me, if you're not interested in Saxon boys, why are you talking to us? I enjoy hearing tales of battle. Do you have any? Battle. A gruesome affair for gentle ladies. The tales would be too much for your gentle hearts. You speak with too much care for gentle ladies. Tell us about the bloodshed. The bloodshed? I'd rather not remember those times. We now have a peaceful land and we should try and get on with the Vikings. You sound like you've been brainwashed. The Vikings will never live in peace with me. Do you feel the same, Leofa? No, I agree with Bronn. We should try to get along with them. You get along with them far too well. Wolfwin, hush. <coughs> what does she mean? Nothing. A Viking gave me a good luck charm and that is all. A token to show the peace, just as you said. Well, that's good. Isn't it, Gallen? Yeah, of course. You should be very proud. Well, go on then. Show them the charm. I don't know. Lisa, you can't say you have a Viking good luck charm and not show it to them. All right. That was given to you by the Viking. A piece of tin. It was from his land. Where did you meet him? Here. Where did he battle? Lidford. Why all the questions? You were happy about keeping the peace a moment ago? Lying Viking. That tin bead is from our land. Oh. Hold on a minute. I lost my sister's talisman in battle. And our Viking dares to give it away as a good luck charm. This can't be. Are you sure? Yes. The magic is trying to find its way back to me. It's a good luck charm. And it's my good luck charm. We should trust her, Gallen, and the Vikings. Never. These Vikings are not to be trusted. My sister's talisman has passed. Well, you better let her keep it then. It's mine to keep. We should leave. Arrgh! Boys and girls, girls and boys, some things never change. Other things do. Now we will leave this time of butter and mountain pastures to go into the medieval age. We move along to the time of pestilence and plague, 1260 AD precisely. Along the way, we will meet the Bishop, Bishop of Exeter, Walter Bronscombe, who is journeying to the moor with his chaplain. What's going on here? I'm being treated like an animal. That's what's going on. Don't take any notice of her, Bishop. Uh, where have you come from? I have come from Kidswell. She's come from Baveney. She's my brother's servant. It was before he died. What's on that sledge? A corpse. Oh, you better have a good explanation, it's, man. Or it said it said would read. My brother, making his final journey to Lidford on the High Moor. And you have to make... Oh, no, 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 the High Moor. Oh, goodness gracious me, I was there just the other day on the High Moor. I so nearly got lost in the fog, didn't I, John? I heard you were tempted by the devil. <coughs> Guys as a Mormon, offering to turn rocks into bread when you were starving hungry. And your chaplain <coughs> to restrain you because he saw horns from your hood and who's beneath your cloak? Where did you get that from? Insolent girls! Absolutely preposterous! <laughs> it's nothing but a, a fabrication put about by my enemies to discredit me. Isn't that so, John? Oh, yes. Definitely, my lord. She relates fabrication well, however. <laughs> I cannot have told the story better myself. <laughs> John! As I was saying, the High Moors is a very dangerous place. Do you have to uh, take this journey every time one of your fellows dies? The route is eight miles in fair weather, but 
15 and foul. How so? On account of the streams. Been too swollen to cross. Keep coming, keep coming. Well, it appears you have made me listen. What on this green and fruitful earth can be important enough to have done such a thing? I hope you're being nicer. I understand it little, but I've been running after you since sun came up. You're the only one that can help me. <coughs> I doubt the light. However, in hearing that a woman is using her legs so, after me or no, deserve the hearing. <laughs> now you have my patience as well as my ears. You have to let my Timothy out of jail, sir. You didn't do anything wrong, and I know you're powerful. I've heard all about you, and you wouldn't let me injustice pass. You speak some truth. The way you see injustice, I may not. You do? I mean, you will. Am I to regret giving you my patience? A woman speaking to me with such force? It is not like me to allow it. But, but sir, they locked my Timothy away for treating the coinage. You did nothing wrong. You have to release them. Nothing wrong? Mary? Tell us where the dragons are. Push for me. Not now. Oh, go on, Miss Mary. Just tell us where you are so you can search. Only in Herbert. We should just go home. <gasps> Do these boys command something of you? Uh, no, no, Sir Walter. It's so it's just a game I play with some farmer's children about dragons. We ain't farmers. We're, We're tinners. tinners. My dad's a tinner. <gasps> if you wish to continue to convince me of your honesty, you must not hide what is going on here. Well, it's hard for me to explain. It sounds mad. <coughs> you ain't mad, Miss Mary. You is brilliant. Hush. I promise you, Miss Mary, so far you have done nothing less to convince me of your insanity. What you consider mad may be your salvation. <coughs> well, it's just I see things. Things that help us find. A beautiful idea. Tell me more. Well, these things, well, they show us where the tin is beneath the ground. How bountiful! What form do these things take? Well, they're kind of fiery. Um... Dragons! Dragons? <laughs> you tell me you see dragons. She does, she does. She helps us find treasure. She's magic! Magic? Do these children speak of some kind of witchcraft? No! No, no, it's no witchcraft. I told you it would be hard for me to explain it. Well, now you must try. Well, well, I can do it. And and my mother can do it. And, and some of the other women can do it. Cornish women. And we don't know why or wherefore. But we see these fiery dragons. They fly across the land and they show us where there's rich loads of tin. And for this they thought your husband was a cheat? Uh, no, not exactly. Ah, well he is a cheat. Well, well, he chopped them lots of tin and they gave him nothing for it, nothing. The year is 1895. Somewhere nearby, Robert Bernard is walking with his photographic device for capturing images. Really? I see. So what was a scientist make of this bead then? Unusual. Tin, I would say. Yes. Definitely, Tim. Where did you get it? You haven't been disturbing burial mounds and robbing tombs, have you? No. Unlike you and your friends. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Anyway, it was passed down to me. Really? Yes. By my mother. So it's modern. That's disappointing. It gives me all the knowledge I need, disappointing or not. How do you mean? Take a look under those peat hags up on Whitehorse Hill. You'll see what I mean. I think I've had enough of your entertaining nonsense. I'm off to dig at Broaden Ring. So he did.
Just 15, 16 years later, in April 1911, census records record a visit from the New Zealand-born nuclear physicist Ernest Rutherford and his wife Mary to the East Dart Hotel in Postbridge, along with the grandson of Charles Darwin and a group of local tin miners. And perhaps at that point you could say that the age of science had fully arrived on Dartmoor. But ours is not a tale of science, it is a tale of magic and of mystery. And we have one more place to go, to the fire over there, where a certain teenager has an appointment with me to see if she can unriddle this tale of tin and time. To the present day we go now. Follow me. I suppose she was, though, see what little interest he took in it. He didn't understand it? No, he didn't. Do you? I think so. So? So my own was important. I think even all of the women were important. Yes, I believe they were. Was what mine possessed really buried? What do you mean? You know, everything in the exhibition. Beads, shale, amber, tin, clothing, bear pelt, baskets. Meadow sweet, a pin, a bracelet, cow hair or horse hair. Well, you certainly seem to know a lot about what was buried with her. It's important. Yes, of course it is. And yet, it's not. Now you're saying that what was buried with her wasn't important. Not to me it's not. When I first heard about it, it really struck me. But really, it's what you showed me that has the important. What Marvin passed to Ginny. The knowledge of interpreting the tin. More than that. She taught her something, didn't she? And she was so strong. And so was Ginny. And then so was Enid. And so were all the others. They were. They understood something people didn't always understand. Mm -hmm. 